Very good. So Ramesh, I'm going right to the source. NAB paclitaxel plus gemcitabine. So we had fulfirinox, we had gemcitabine, and then last year at our GI ASCO, our gastrointestinal cancer symposium, we heard the data on the gem NAB paclitaxel impact data. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Right. So the the impact study that was based on an earlier phase one two study, um, which uh, we participated in, um, in, in that study. The response rate was about 45%, and median survival uh, actually was one of the highest in a phase two study and was uh, around 12 months, more than a year. And that led to the phase three study, which was an international study, uh, 860 patients, 110 sites, um, Europe, Australia. Um, and uh, the differences between this and the Falfirinox study was that um, the majority of patients came from community sites, and it did allow some number of ECOG-2 patients. 40% had KPS 70 to 80, and KPS 70 translates to ECOG-2, and there was no upper age limit. The median survival was uh, 8.7 months, compared to around 6.5 for gemcitabine, and um, it was, uh, the p-value was very, very significant, so it's clearly better than gemcitabine alone. And when I looked at the toxicity profile, um, it was pretty well tolerated, low incidence on neutropenic fever, 25% got growth factor. So it's certainly a regimen which can be given in day-to-day -day practice to the majority of patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer. So certainly another treatment option for these patients. Excellent. You know what, what's, uh, forgive me, but you know, the paper that came out in the New England Journal and the studies that came out in the abstracts in, in ASCO herald something that was very important. Here is a trial that was primarily done in the community about 50% of the patients came from the community, which really is a great reflection of what we see as the diversity of all our patients. Because what's interesting about pancreatic patients is that some come in as sick as can be, and others may have come in be with a performance status that is absolutely excellent, 90 plus percent, but they've been found to have painless jaundice or they had pain that needed elucidation. And is this dichotomy because when you have this diversity of the type of patient, you really need to see a study that is going to take a look at all comers, not just those that have a perfect performance status, but those that can be less than perfect. So Francis, you really allude to some of the differences that we saw with these trials because now we've got two great regimens with response rates, which we've never really seen before. Um, we've got improvements in progression-free and overall survival, so how do you choose which one to use? And so there's been a lot of discussion about the study populations um, that were in each of the different trials, right? So the full Fironox study in centers in France who had used the regimen, they were used to the regimen and the potential toxicities. We have um, the, the gem napaclitaxel, as, as you spoke about, that it was done in a community center so, and worldwide study um, for people that might not have been used to using this regimen. And when you look at the two regimens head to head, when you look at the trial data, which is not fair, right? Yeah. Um, you see a little bit of a higher response rate and a little bit of a higher survival in full Fearnox than gem napaclitaxel. But can we really say that that's reality? So tell me, what are, what are your thoughts? I'm going to go down the line here. What are your thoughts, Fulfirinox or Gemnab Paclitaxel? Wow. Do I like the Yankees or do I like the <laughs> L.A. Dodgers? I like the Yankees. Um, the idea here is, I, I think you said the first things first. You can't really compare. It's not cricket to compare two studies. That, that we're not made to do so. But if we delve a little bit and we, we use a little bit of uh, artistic uh, powers here, the Fulfurinox data was really based on patients with very good performance status, zero to one. And when you take a look at those patients that were in the uh, Napacotaxel and Gemzar, it was a more open slate. You got up to two, as Ramesh said. I, I'm a little bit old-fashioned. I, I think we, we learned way back when that Gem has the ability of improving the performance status of many of our patients. About a quarter to a third of the patients will improve on GEM their performance status. And I'm sort of old-fashioned in thinking, said, hey, listen, why should I give up that one ace that I have? I can make my patient feel better. And so I would delve with that. I don't think we have a head-to-head -head science. I don't think it's fair to try to do so. But 
I, I'm taking a little page out of each book. Yeah. So Ramesh, now realize Dan might see this. Right. So what, what's, your, what's your vote? <laughs> I think the way I look at it is, um, so when you see a patient with metastatic pancreatic cancer, certainly you have to stratify them in good performance status and not so good performance status. So you have a patient with a good performance status, a younger patient. I think we have two good regimens, Falfurinox and gems had to be named Paclitaxel. Um, I think people should uh, get uh, experience with both, see how it works in their patient population. Uh, I don't think you should use one exclusively and not use the other. I think it's important to get experience because we, you, you may want to sequence them. If your good performance status patient fails, progresses on one regimen, you may want to use the other, and we have done that. Um, and I always say the easiest thing is when you have a di difficult decision is to have a clinical trial. That takes the choice out of it. A clinical trial is the first option. So right. does anybody think we're going to do that clinical trial? Uh, not head to head, but head -to -head. no. But there are a number of studies. Uh, at the last count, I think there were 20 plus studies with GEM, NAP, Paclitaxel, plus new agent. Yes. And probably 10, 15 with Falfurinox. So Gabi, as you, as you answer this question, as you've been preparing, I'm going to throw you a curveball. So one thing that people have been discussing is the toxicity profiles of both regimens, right? And you did a beautiful job of talking about the Fulfirinox toxicity profile. What's your, what's your sense of which regimen is more toxic? Um, I think that in my heart and mind, I have no doubt that Fulfirinox is more toxic. Even despite all the supportive care that we propose patients, there are exceptionally few patients that don't have side effects with Fulfirinox. Majority have many more side effects. And we do see this in our practices when one patient goes to Fulfirinox and it doesn't work, they go on genabraxin and almost univer universally people say this is so much easier. So when you ask the same patient exposed to the two regimens, I haven't had yet a patient who said Fulfirinox was a better regimen for him or her. So yes, gemabraxin, I think it's easier on patients. So we do see potentially a little bit more neuropathy and a little bit earlier onset neuropathy with a braxane, but also easier to reverse. So I think that the fatigue is better with gemabraxin, the GI toxicity is better with gemabraxin. The neuropathy might be a little bit worse, a little bit faster onset, but also easier to reverse. So uh, in my opinion, I think that these regimens for the same patient population are very equivalent. I do think that we have to explain them both to the patients and ultimately it's the patient that makes a decision with what they feel comfortable. But um, Toxicity-wise, I, I do agree that it's easier. Efficacy, I think they are very comparable in, in the equivalent patient populations. Ramesh, do you think their efficacy, in, in your just sort of anecdotal use of it, do you get a feel one way or the other? I think so. Uh, uh, with the GEM cytobine napaclisol regimen, we had done a number of pilot studies, and we consistently get a response rate of 40 to 50 percent, uh, median survival of 12 months in two, stu two pilot studies. So I think, so that again show, shows the selection part of it. If you select the patients, good performance status, uh, good attention to supportive care, you get results same as Falfurinox. But again, uh, the data will come in the next two, three years. I think we'll see more and more, so not head to head, but separate studies and we'll get a feeling for this. How about you, Francis? What's your gut? My gut is, I think we're in the same place that we were with colon cancer when we first had Fulfox and then we had Fulfury. And then there were all these wonderful studies trying to see who should be used first and who could be used second, and turned out it was a dealer's choice. And I have a feeling it's going to be dealer's choice because, let's face it, everybody's going to relapse. So we really need to know some very important information. Who comes up first and how do you handle it? And what can we put something second? Because we're going to need a second and hopefully to God we're going to need a third. And if we can do that, then I think we've made some major headway. I think it's interesting that you allude to colon cancer, because I almost feel like pancreas cancer, and we should be happy this is happening, right. maybe turning into exactly. to colon cancer. Where we, and I'm seeing more and more patients where we need third line options. Yeah. Um, so, Gabby, we're going to.